Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Writer's Hive. Today's episode, I am joined, as always, by Caitlin and Amber. All of their information will be listed down below. And today's episode is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be one of our first honey seats, hot seats. It's going to be a writer-specific and uh, member-specific episode. And today, I am so excited to be talking to Caitlin about her upcoming book, Take back your book. Look how sweet it is. An author's guide to rights reversion, which I had the absolute pleasure of reading early. So I have an, an insider knowledge about the book. Um, but we're going to get some questions from myself, from Amber, and let Caitlin discuss the book a little bit. Uh, so first, Caitlin, why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? And then obviously links will be down below for everything. Yes, absolutely. So uh, Take Back Your Book, An Author's Guide to Rights Reversion and Publishing on Your Terms is sort of my memoir about going through the rights reversion process for my debut series. When I was approaching a rights reversion on uh, that series, I did a lot of research on what to do with my book after rights reversion. And I unfortunately didn't find much. So I did find a lot of information out there about how to get your rights reverted and recommendations, but I didn't understand the process. And I'm a very process type person and I need to understand risk ahead of time before like moving forward with something like this. Um, so I sort of muddled through the process, pulling from some amazing authors who were um, just so great to be able to give me their point of view on the reversion process. I do have a few of those authors in the book, I do like little mini interviews with them just to get a little more perspective, which I had had during my reversion process and, you know, pushing towards self-publishing these books. And then I just sort of put it all together in the hopes of informing other writers what you can do with your books. They're no longer selling with your publisher, whether it's a traditional deal or a small press, indie press. Most uh, contracts have a reversion clause um, that basically states that after a certain amount of time after publication, the author has the right to take back all of the rights to their book. To, and these vary widely. And I'm going to make a disclaimer up front that I am not a lawyer. I'm not a literary lawyer. I recommend hiring a lawyer or talking to an agent if you ever have, if you're in the process of a book deal and you have a contract. But um, in terms of reverting, there's, a, there's different stipulations per contract on when you can ask for reversion. The book as a whole is just my process with how I did this. And in the hopes of reaching other authors um, who are either in the process now or are thinking about trad publishing um, in just sort of informing what you can do to take back your book rights after a certain amount of time if the publisher is not selling the book that the way that you want. Um, I think it's a very powerful clause that will take a book that is not selling, that you love, obviously, because you're the author, and then it sort of breathes new life into it. You can take that book back from your publisher and basically do whatever you want with it. And in this wonderful age of, the, of indie publishing, you do have the opportunity to make your book make you money for years to come. So this is sort of a memoir for myself, an inspirational book to authors, and I really hope that it helps authors um, become more aware of the publishing process and things you can do if your book is not selling any longer. So you touched a little bit upon this whenever you were um, talking about what the book is about, but you know, as we all know, as authors, there's different levels of traditional publishing. So in your research, do you feel like there's a different level of difficulty of getting the rights reverted, but between like a digital first or digital only, an indie press or like a like a big five publisher? From my understanding of the process um, and talking to other people, it seems like a very straightforward process when you have reached these stipulations. So for instance, if a contract states, you know, three years after publication date um, and uh, sometimes it's a monetary, sometimes it's a physical. So say the book is selling less than 250 units over uh, the last four quarters. So the last year in a sense. So if your book is selling, you know, a hundred copies in that time frame, uh, you would have the right 
to ask for those book rights back. So it's really straightforward in the contract. That's why I strongly suggest that if people are not already in contracts, if authors are not already in contracts, that they uh, make sure that they're happy with that clause because they're between the, I've received four contracts so far between all of them. It's been wildly different um, in terms of how many units are sold or if it's a monetary amount. One of my contracts states I have to make a certain amount of money within a certain amount of period for me to be able to ask for them back. But once you have that set up, it's pretty much very simple and you just ask for those rights back. I do have two sample letters um, in the book that you can use as sort of a template. You know, that's not a memoir. It's really straightforward. I want these book rights back because as stated in the contract, I have under the amount that you wanted or under the monetary amount. And, um, you know, I have the right to ask for them back. And it's a little more structured uh, than what I just said, but um, it's very simple. So I have successful stories in my book and I really wanted to have like an unsuccessful story in rights reversion. So I do have an author, Terry Nixon, and she was so amazing to be able to give her her point of view on this because technically she has not had her rights reverted back yet. Sometimes publishers will say that, oh, I will do this, this, and this to get your books out of reversion. Um, So that in a sense, you do want that that was your original goal, right? When you publish a book, you want your publisher to sell it for you. But when it's not been selling for a little bit, it's a little discouraging to authors to, to not get their rights back in the publishing contracts. It's very interesting now that we have a digital, you know, ebooks um, and digital audiobooks. These do count toward your book being in print. So if you're selling on certain platforms, that's all brought in together. You know, if you need to sell 250 units, for example, if you're selling, uh, you know, I'm not going to do any math, but if you're selling enough in all of those formats, you cannot ask for reversion. So that would be the only difficulty is if, you know, it's not selling quite the way you wanted. You can't ask for a version as long, you know, if it's still within those stipulations. Because you signed the contract, because your publisher signed that contract, it's usually just a request. And then most of the time, um, if the evidence is there, you'll get your rights back. I had a quick question too. And I I know a a little bit of the behind the scenes about this, uh, just from speaking to you and, and reading the book. I think that a lot of authors or a lot of people watching, right, who maybe haven't traditionally published yet, aren't necessarily in this situation, might say well, this book may not be for me because it doesn't apply to me. But as somebody who has not traditionally published yet, but wants to traditionally publish, I found a lot of value in knowing what my rights could be down the line, in knowing what I should look at in terms of going into a contract, which you've kind of touched on. In what ways do you feel like this would be beneficial for people who maybe aren't in a position to revert right at this moment but are looking to get into the traditionally publishing sphere. I do have uh, some advice as well, because when I was writing this book, I I tried to think of my ideal reader. um, And it's really me at three different stages of my writing publishing process. It was me when I was frustrated with um, my sales on a particular book um, and then you know went on to the rest of them too the longer that they've been published the me that had a contract in hand from a publisher um, who didn't really understand everything in a contract when you read any contract it's really the the particular language that lawyers use is just wild to me so i uh, i try to understand it best i can but a lot of people feel like it's oh i have this opportunity and this publisher is going to sell my book. So you just, sometimes people just sign it anyway. And I was one of those people that didn't really take a good look. So I wrote it for that part of myself as well. And then I wrote it for myself after I finished a book and was interested in traditionally publishing. And I didn't really know much about it. And um, one of the things that inspired that is because right now there's been a lot of really heated discussions on traditional publishing out there. Um, A lot of the Twitter conversations and giving a little more transparency uh, to the publishing industry and things that are happening and things that, you know, authors aren't allowed to talk about. Um, But I think if you're not contracted to not talk about anything, um, it's, it's really your opportunity to say whatever you'd like, especially um, you know, in our position where we, you know, talk about writing a lot. Um, It's important to be honest 
and uh, transparent about the situations that do happen behind the scenes. And I'm in no way saying that publishers are bad, but I think that authors should have a toolkit when they're going into these situations. You have to be your best advocate for yourself, your career, and your book. Having this information out there, whether or not you are in this position, I hope that I have given you enough ammo, I guess, for your toolbox or for your, uh, you know, creating some sort of uh, Kevlar vest for yourself to to be able to take as much as you can with, with this process and arm yourself for this. And if someone is not offering what you want for your book, then give yourself uh, the, the courage and encouragement, hopefully from myself to be able to say no, or to say, I want this changed. And if you don't want to do that, I need to do what's best for my book and, and walk, which I understand is very difficult. Just opening some doors that were not open before in terms of welcoming you into the, the background of what happens that people don't necessarily talk about frequently. So when you research and talking with other authors, is the clause something that a lot of publishers are willing to negotiate? Or is it just like they use a blanket clause for their all of their authors? I have never been one to hone in on this particular clause. As I said, I was very unaware of what I could do with it and how powerful it could be. Um, the clauses that I tend to focus on usually are option clauses um, in terms of next books. Um, so I don't have experience and I haven't heard anyone's experience with this particular one. But I would say everything that is in your contract at least you can ask, um, is this negotiable? I would really like this, which is why agents are very important and also literary lawyers. Um, I've never had an agent. So for my second contract, I did second or third, I ended up hiring a literary lawyer, like a specific literary lawyer, because um, I made a huge mistake on my first contract to have my lawyer who sold me my house or de dealt with all of the closing documents look at my contract. And he thought it looked fantastic uh, because he wasn't uh, aware of the nuances of a literary contract and things that could affect a future author's career, such as an option clause, which, you know, some really nasty option clauses out there um, don't allow you to publish anything like ever once you sign that contract. So it can be really, really, you have to be very careful with that. And that's a whole other book, uh, <laughs> which I probably will not write, but never say never. Yeah, I haven't had experiences with that particular one, but you know, you can always ask. And if they say no, you have to make that decision um, on whether or not you will sign that contract or not. So my question is, if you have an underperforming book, you're not meeting your sales numbers or monetary numbers, what would be the reasons for taking that back? If it's not performing well enough, why would taking it back and republishing it matter? What, what would the benefit in that be? Absolutely. I mean, if you want to sell a book and not make any money, that you can, I guess. I mean, I've done it, you know, and I, when, with these books that have, you know, haven't sold for years, which is why I was able to get them reverted. You can keep your book wherever you want. You don't have to ask for rights reversion. Um, you can ask potentially for your, um, your editors to pitch to uh, publishing committees and say, hey, I want, you know, more marketing or whatever. But in the traditional sense of publishing, they are very launch heavy. So you will notice with any authors that you follow, it's very much so it's launching, it's launching, it's launching. And then do you hear anything about that book? Really? After that? Not really. Because publishing, uh, traditional publishing, and when I say traditional, I don't know if I mentioned that, but I mean like small presses, anything like that. It doesn't just have to be the big five. They're always on to the next book after that. So if you are passionate about your book and your stories, which I've seem to move into with indie publishing. Indie publishing, the community, tends to focus on backlist, all of their books. I mean, no one wants to write a book and then like publish it and then no one ever buys it again. Like you want these books to work, work for you for years to come. You want to make money. You want to find more readers. And then the more books you publish, those readers who are reading your backlist want to read your front list. And then the people that see the front list, which are the books that are published within like 
the last book you publish is, you know, your front list usually. Um, and then they go read your back list. So it's very cyclical in the indie community. Um, and you want, you know, they want people to read their books for years to come and, you know, to continue to make money and drive sales um, always. So um, that would be a reason um, if you still champion for your book um, and you want it to continue to work for you. You know, you can ask for your book rights to be reverted and then you self-publish the book yourself. And I do go into there's a whole section on um, self-publishing your book because I was at a point where I had trad published 13 books and I was like, I don't know how to do this. And there's a lot of nuances to uh, self-publishing because you are the publisher. So you have to do all of the things that were done for you previously setting up editors, cover design, um, any marketing, even such things as like ISBNs and a copyright page, things that authors who are, who have contracts don't have to do. So I do have a whole section about that because I had to sort of muddle my way through the process. And as a caveat, I was a digital first author, which means all of my books came out in ebook. Um, and then if they sold enough, I would have the opportunity, which I didn't, um, only two of my 13 books um, became paperbacks and audiobooks. Um, but if you sell enough, you have that opportunity with a publisher. Taking your digital first or digital only book back, now I can do whatever I want with them. I can create audiobooks, hardbacks, paperbacks, special editions, large print, anything your heart desires, everything that you've ever wanted for your book. So it's just a decision that you have to make. It's a lofty decision. There's a lot of um, things that go in behind the scenes and a lot of money up front. Um, but I believe that the money that you spend up front, you will be able to make back once you take control over your book. So even besides self-publishing, if you got your rights back, you could also re-query to other agents, right? You can't. And that's something that I do mention in the book as well, because people do think of that. And that's the same thing. We've had discussions before about self-publishing. And once you sort of put like a paperback out there, it's it's sort of there forever, especially we were talking about Amazon in a previous episode. There are unicorns out there um, that you'd be able to take a book back and then repackage it. I would not recommend it. Um, because once your book has been out there, there are sales numbers that publishers can look at and know that this is not the first time that the book has been out there. You take the book back from your publisher and you either like do nothing with it, like if it doesn't fit your brand anymore, or um, you have to publish it yourself. It is good to note too that you could probably republish it with a publisher later if you if your career trajectory changed because like look at victoria schwab her first book went out of print she had the rights reverted and she just sat on it and then once she actually became popular again another publisher picked up and wanted to publish it again which was the near witch but unless you're that unicorn it's just self-published or sit. yeah i mean if, if you have sales numbers like victoria schwab Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But um, for most people, uh, they will, you know, once those numbers are out there, once, um, you know, that's other publishers can see if this book has been published before, they usually won't touch it. And even in the instance of uh, we've discussed in the past, so publishing once the book is published. And I know there are authors who've done that. Um, Amanda Hawking is one of like the more famous um, examples. But again, unicorn. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach writing your first nonfiction versus fiction? Because I have to imagine that would be a much different undertaking than previously fiction books. Yeah, it was quite a process. And e even as I'm going through um, the later stages of uh, republishing the first book in that reverted series, uh, Soul Taken, I'm finding that process so much easier than it was for this one. Um, so I've never written a nonfiction book before. And there's such a different mindset you need to have with it. And, and one thing I never thought about is you still have to tell a story throughout a nonfiction book. It's not going to be Save the Cat Writes a Novel structure, um, but it's going to be, uh, you know, you sort of have that flow of a story. So you start off with like, you know, the basics of the information and then you move into more complex and then you sort of, you know, close it out. Um, so it was 
wildly different and also to this the self-publishing process of structuring the book in a certain way formatting the book in a certain way that other books look like um, so I did read a lot of nonfiction, which I tend to do anyway. I know moving forward, if I want to uh, publish another nonfiction book, I understand that it's going to be a much different process. It was a lot of moving parts in terms of the structure and everything. So it was just very different, but I did have a lot of good resources. My shelf full of nonfiction books was very helpful. Um, I did read Rachel Heron's, um, I think it's How to Fast Draft a Memoir. It was very knowledgeable um, with, the, with the whole process of, of nonfiction. As somebody who got an early sneak peek of this, I have to say, from somebody who also reads a lot of nonfiction and is completely unbiased, this did have a really nice flow to it. And I love when a book has uh, very actionable steps, which you manage to still do while having like a narrative that flowed underneath all the information. And I found it so beneficial as somebody who is going through an indie press, but then also trying to traditionally publish as well. Um, I personally got a lot out of it. And I'm very excited for this to be out in the world for other people to benefit from it the way that I did. So tell us where we can find it. Absolutely. Uh, Take Back Your Book is available currently in ebook and paperback and hardback because I have all my rights to this book and I can publish it how I please. Uh, so I am a wide author, which means that my book is available on all retailers. So Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google Play, and everywhere else, basically. So uh, you can get it anywhere and uh, the link to uh, purchase it is in the description box below if you're interested. And obviously, if you have any other questions about the book, um, let me know in the comments and I'll jump in um, as I can to answer any questions. Well, thank you for being our first hot seat guest, honey seat guest. And uh, be sure when you pick up the book, because I, I know you will, you guys are all here for the same thing. The Writer's Hive is a fantastic opportunity to further discuss the publishing and writing journey. And this book truly does dive into an aspect that we haven't been able to share yet and that really only Kate out of the three of us is able to and I'm so glad that she decided to share her expertise and a behind the scenes look with us it really truly is invaluable so when you purchase it don't forget to also leave reviews at all of the places for Kate um, it absolutely helps indie authors authors in general and I, I know what kind of hard work went into this book and I hope you're incredibly proud of it. It's, it's amazing. So congratulations. Thank um, you. Yay. It's a fantastic book. So be sure to check out the links down below for all the places that you can find. Take back your book by Caitlin Duncan. And uh, we will see you in two weeks with another episode of The Writer's Hive. But definitely leave any comments down below for Caitlin. And let us know, is there a topic that we have not covered yet that you are dying for us to unpack? Leave it in a comment down below and we will feature it in another episode. For now, that's everything. Bye, guys. Blooper reel. Uh, from a layman's. That's not a word. Give me a second. Layman is a word. Layman? Layman. That was layman. Layman? I don't want to. Layman's? Layman's? Layman's. 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 But I think it's layman. It's just you say it. People say it so fast. It's just like a layman's term. Layman? Yeah, layman. Okay. It sounded weird. I was, I wanted more of an E than an A and it came off weird. Anyway. Layman's term. I'm not going to use that word at all anymore. Have I been making any sense? I think I blacked out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tons. In getting the rights revered. Forever. Please make it make sense. I will. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Screw you guys. That's fine. I play with myself. I play with myself all day long. <laughs>